Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I am R. Purcell. I am the founding host of the podcast. I've been crewing up on films um, for over 10 years. Uh, I've produced and or directed uh, over 12 films, uh, either shorts or features. And I'm just finishing up um, posts on my first feature as a writer, director, the alternate. I'm Liz Manischel. I'm a writer, director, producer who happens to cast uh, the films that I make. I have two features under my belt and I'm possibly doing a third, uh, something to talk about later. <laughs> it's very confusing to me. Wow. I'm a former film critic, current distribution consultant, and I used to manage a department at Sundance called the Creative Distribution Initiative. Wow. So this week we have co-stars and writers and directors of the show. Everyone is doing great on Hulu. Uh, James Lafferty and Stephen Coletti, who met while starring on the CW show uh, One Tree Hill, which is pretty fun. Um, and then they came together afterwards, um, you know, having been friends on the show and they, you know, made this show, uh, you know, everyone is doing great as their first like project as filmmakers and not just actors. Um, so we're going to jump right into the interview with these guys, but don't go away because you have, we have a pretty outrageous short film from Derek Viverios, who's a, um, you know, listener and a supporter of the show. Thank you, Derek. And another great edition of you've got mail as always, but, um, yeah. Yeah. So no more jibber jabber. Let's get to the interview. Um, we are here with James Lafferty and Stephen Coletti. Thank you guys for joining. Thanks for having us. So I'm going to start with our uh, rapid fire questions. So I don't know who wants to do this first one, but can you give us an elevator pitch for everyone is doing great? James is much better at this. I'm going to toss oh, it to boy. him. Um, <laughs> think log line. Think log line. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a show about um, uh, basically the cast. It's uh, three lead cast members of a, an old show called Eternal that was on five years ago. It was like a hit teen vampire drama and um these uh this jeremy davis Seth Stewart, and andrea cooper davis and they're all sort of their lives are still intertwined because they were on this show together and they had this shared experience but um they're very much being sort of torn in different ways and uh it's just a comedy about uh, a little friend's family uh trying to stick together when when life is really pulling them apart well done. Uh, how many, well, we usually ask a feature how many days they shot, which is difficult to apply to for, how, how long have you been working on the project? <laughs> we shot it for 30, with 33 days, actually. Okay, thank you. Well, 33 plus two plus about four. So it was about 37 in total for all eight episodes. <laughs> wow. We just, we shot it like a, like a feature. We, 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 oh. instead of going from episode to episode, um, you know, we blocked it all out and, and shot out locations and, and moved on to the next yeah, and we started working on it, and um, I think we had the idea at the very beginning of 2017. Um, I think we started shooting the pilot in um, April of 2017, right? And yep. then um, from from shooting the pilot to actually finishing the um, the first season and getting it onto Hulu, that um, you know it took up until uh, when did we release? A month ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, ja till January, mid January 2021. And, and just as a really super side question, but um, how long are the episodes? Are they an hour? Are they half hour? Like, um, how much content was that in 34 days? Yeah, it was uh, over four hours. Um, it was kind of like doing two features. It was like, like four and a half hours. We have an average of about 33 minutes per episode, but it goes from anywhere from 25 up to uh, 37, 38. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you can say, I don't know if you, if you can or if you're comfortable, what was the budget or the rough budget for the, the show? Uh, yeah, so we crowdfunded um, a budget of, uh, well, sorry, so we, we crowdfunded around, I think, 225000 right? Um, it was, it was, we actually raised 270000 but there's a, all kinds of fees and whatnot that go into it um, that get cut out. So I think we came away with around 220000 We went to a uh, financier for another 125000 um, to complete the budget. Um, we spent 50000 of our own money um, on the pilot. Um, and uh, the rest of it, you know, that was all a raise for the rest of the first season. 
So I think it came to around 400,000 um, when it was all said and done. Wow. Uh, how big was the crew? We had um, on any given day about 25, 30 people. Mm-hmm. And um, some days we had like four people. <laughs> oh, yeah. When we, 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 we did like a skeleton crew out when we were in North Carolina or when we were in uh, the like Redwoods. A- shoots actors and stuff. Are booms and stuff. <laughs> That's true. That's true. We had, uh, yeah, there were some days where we had about a five person crew, including two actors. <laughs> um, and then compared to all the other projects you've made, how difficult was this one? Uh, well, th- I think this was our first, um, this was our first foray into wearing all these different hats and to, uh, writing, producing and directing and starring in, um, in terms of like long form, you know, um, in, in terms of trying to build a whole TV show or a, a fully formed project. Um, so I'd say, you know, in my experience has been uh, directing on in television uh, before this, like my experience behind the camera. Um, and, it, you know, that's obviously very challenging, but you're just not wearing as many hats. And um, the, I've been fortunate enough to get some gigs where you have actually a lot of resources and it's all kind of um, set up for you and it's all very streamlined. Um, this was this was a totally different experience than um, than anything I've come up against before. Uh, so I'd say it, it just doesn't even really compare. I think um, you know building something from the ground up on an independent level doesn't compare to anything I've done so far today. Ditto. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. agree there. It was a crash course in crash course in uh, show writing, and it was still very tough. Even though we had a tremendous amount of help, uh, our producing team was very crucial. To this whole thing and we can talk more about them um uh down the line here but yeah it was um yeah, it's definitely the most challenging because we, we've done we've done each you know worn these different hats separately at different times small form and james you know like directing and um and even writing uh episodes for one tree hill um but uh to do it all at once it was yeah a, a much different ask um i wanted to ask about i guess you know, we want to hear about the origin of the idea and everything like that. But also, I'm hearing crowdfunding, which is not traditional for television, right? I mean, there's obviously like circumstances that people can point to, but usually it's a short feature game for crowdfunding in the arts, other than video games and board games and, and the like. Um, did you do this without a distribution plan? Were you like, we're going to make this, we're going to fund this? Or did you have that Hulu carrot the entire time? Can you talk a little bit about like, the confidence to put this together and to crowdfund? Yeah, um, so we went into it totally blind. Uh, we shot the pilot, hoping to shot the pilot around and hopefully get a series greenlit by you know a distributor or somebody, whoever would pick it up. Uh, that didn't happen, but we knew we had a great story. We knew we had something special on our hands because we had been taking the show out to um, uh, series festivals, TV festivals, mm-hmm. and just getting um, really great feedback and people were loving it. and. Uh, so we felt that we, we we just felt really confident that we had you know well, something special here. So uh, we just sort of you know when we did, when we couldn't sell that pilot when we couldn't really sell the series per se we just decided heck let's go for it. Like you know we wrote a a really streamlined um, season. We wrote a season to be shot for the least amount of money possible. Um, so let's go raise whatever that number is, um, however we can, and um, and let's let's uh, you know let's make it ourselves and. Our producing team really encouraged us to go the crowdfunding route because Ian and Esham Nelms had crowdfunded for their first film, Lost on Purpose, and they really loved the way that it helped them uh, retain creative control. It helped them make sure that they could make their movie and that nobody was going to come in and, um, you know, and chip away at it little by little, um, be it, you know, at the script level or during production or in the edit. Um, they were just able to make their their movie the way they wanted to make their movie, and they wanted that for us. So. That's where the whole sort of crowdfunding thing came from, really. Um, and then after that, it was, you know, we were still we were still flying blind at that point in, in terms of distribution. Uh, we had no idea. And I think that was the hardest part. It was having no idea where this thing would land, whether it would be a self-distribution situation or we would get uh, picked up by, you know, a network or a streamer or, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to buoy your confidence when you really have no idea where this thing is headed. Um, but fortunately, you know, our belief in the project itself and the creative aspect of things was, was what really got us through. So just to hone into that a little bit more, like when did the Hulu thing happen? Was it like after that you crowdfunded and like the show was being made or was it when the whole show was shot, edited and done and then you shopped it to Hulu? Like 
what time did that partnership come into play? This was like our third go around of getting the show out there. And at various levels, we had um, more help because we were more of a, a real show. You know, it was like originally it was an idea and we're kind of taking it out there, getting some feelers. Not We don't, you know, have access to any door in, in, in Hollywood um, or anything, but just using our contacts to see if we can get into some places and check some interest. Um, and then once we, um, you know, after doing that and, 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 you know, not getting, not having any success, uh, and then eventually having the episodes, once we actually had shot all the episodes, um, and we were, you know, taking out what was now a fully formed series. Um, we had eight episodes and, you know, we felt like we could give people more of a piece of, of what the show was and, and, you know, send them the first three episodes. Uh, and again, uh, not even only that, actually sending, we'd send some people the first three episodes, but we also held some uh, quote unquote buyer screenings, um, which we, you know, Nobody weren't very, to. yeah, yeah, that's a nice <laughs> way of putting it, James. Uh, when we, we happen to schedule or get a theater, you know, 530 on a Friday in, in the middle of Los Angeles uh, a couple times there and just like, you know, we had a lot, a lot of our SVPs, but then people actually showing up and sitting their butts in the theater did not did not happen. So um, those, again, were, were not very successful for us. And we still, we didn't have anybody repping the show properly. Uh, we were kind of using our talent agents um, and, again, other connections to just see who we can meet. Um, and uh, so we were, felt like we weren't getting, we still, it was always driving us. is like we haven't got into Hulu. We haven't got into Amazon or Netflix. We haven't gotten that, like, no from the official uh, platforms that we really thought this would, this would thrive on. Um, and it wasn't until uh, early in the pandemic, actually, of last year, one of our producers, uh, Stuart Lafferty, who's actually James Lafferty's little brother, um, who and the, we could talk more about this down the line here. But I mean, he was a, a PA for us in the beginning who worked his ass off during our shoot. Um, and our team came to us. and was like, hey, we should bump him up to producer. And we're like, heck, yeah, let's do it. And then, you know down the line there Stu's out there hustling the show with the rest of us and he had a contact that um had a buddy at endeavor content um who he thought he can get the show to and from there uh endeavor content took on the show in um april of 2020 and uh admittingly they said you know this kind of like indie shows we don't do a ton of them um but right now with the unknown with the pandemic uh we're more interested in picking up content especially stuff that's fully formed so we were totally in the right place, right time scenario. And um, from there, you know, they took it on and they, they took it out. Um, and they got in to the right buyers uh, mm -hmm. at these places uh, to give us our fair shake. Um, and thankfully, you know, we got a bite with Hulu. I just, I don't, I'm hoping there's a question at the end of this comment. Uh, you, you talk about it like this outsider perspective, like, oh, you didn't have these relationships, right? And you crowdfunded, but... Um, I think anyone listening would be like, come on, these guys are like, they're Hollywood guys. Like, of course they have friends and of course they could get finance for, financing for the show. Did your personal audiences, um, did they did they help secure deals for you? Or do you did you really do feel powerless in this in these scenarios? I think it's just it's interesting because I think it's I, I understand how people could think that um, that we would have had those connections to just, you know, get this thing in some kind of pipeline straight to distribution. But the industry is um, siloed in ways that are very mysterious to, you know, somebody who's just made their first project. And, um, you know, for instance, like we didn't even know. I mean, this just could speak to how naive we were as well. Like we just didn't even know who we should be showing it to. Right. Like mm -hmm. we're going out through our talent reps to development people at these different companies. And we really had no idea that who we should be talking to was people in the acquisitions department. Like we didn't even know to ask specifically for those people in the acquisitions department. And then if we, if we did, you know, our, our reps, they didn't have the connections to get to those people. What we really needed was the gatekeeper, right? Which is the, you know, the sales rep at a respectable, reputable company. And, um, we just we didn't understand the value of it because we didn't have it and we didn't know how to get it. And it's not like, you know, there's road signs everywhere in, in Hollywood or tons of people you can ask who can point you in the right direction because, um, you know, it's just a murky world out there, um, especially the world of sales reps. It's like we got more advice on what not to do than than advice on who to go to. Um, so it really did feel like this this incredible sort of like Hail Mary when Stuart found a, us um, our way to Endeavor. 
And we really did see the power of those companies um, when things started happening quickly with Endeavor. Um, so it was, you know, you know, regardless of the fact that we have been in front of the camera, um, you know, for for a long time now, um, these different sort of sectors of the industry are really sort of it's hard to pull the curtain back um, from them because um, it's not like they're actively hiding from you, but they aren't also making themselves uh, these these people and these opportunities aren't actually making themselves totally uh, available to you. Yeah. The rat race of, of Hollywood, you know, the wheels are constantly spinning and to catch someone's attention, there's just so much going on. There's so much out there. Um, and, um, you know, they're, they're usually a lot of these sales agents, you know, they're, they're playing with, with big hitter stuff, uh, big name talent, stuff like that, you know, really, really bankable things. Um, and it's, it's hard to, you know, as we all know, been in the industry, you know, uh, getting something made is a miracle. Uh, selling something is another miracle. There's just there, there's a lot of little miracles along the way, um, and uh, yeah, I, I felt like there was t- we we had trouble even getting um, a sales agent or even finding one. Um, mm. w- once we realized early on, after kind of using our talent reps who you know find us acting work and their connections, that we weren't really getting that shot where we were like, ah, oh, well, we tried, you know, we're like, no, we still haven't gone in there. Um, we realized, okay, we need to get a sales agent. And we're, we're, we we spent almost a year trying to get a sales agent, like trying to find the right one and somebody, um, you know, who, who we felt would take on the show. And, and it was literally by accident that, that, that Stu, you know, where I guess Stu was aware, of course, being on a producing team that we were looking for a sales agent, but, um, or that was kind of our missing piece. Um, but it, it was after a long time, um, was striking out and, and, and getting contacts, uh, contacts, that actually, you know, we found the sales agent. Um, well, I think it should be noted that, like, you know, obviously, in order to raise that much money on crowdfunding, like, it's got to be due to your fan basis, right? Like, you know, Liz and I have both crowdfunded. Like, you know, <laughs> get, just getting ten or twenty thousand dollars is like seems like a miracle to us, but like, you know, two hundred thousand, two hundred seventy thousand is like incredible. So, I guess the question is. Like, were there certain specific things that you did with your crowdfunding campaign in order to reach those people? Like, were there ways that you sought out the One Hill Tree fans and other fans of your other work that you might have, um, you know, monopolized to get the the crowdfunding to be successful? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because it's you're you're so right. Like, our the following that we have from One Tree Hill is is really you know what delivered us to this moment that we're in right now, and the fact that they were you know. If you're on a show, you, the fans of that show, it's not always a guarantee that they're going to follow you into the next thing or support the next thing that you do, um, especially if it's crowdfunding. And so there was no guarantee that this was going to go well. And, um, you know, we're continually struck by just how supportive they've been and um, how just how much they got behind the show. Um, and I think one big thing that helped us, um, like obviously, you know, having that presence was a huge cut above um, and we totally acknowledge that and we're su- super grateful for that but i think another thing that really gave us the edge was that we were able to take we were able to time our campaign for our sort of festival run and i think the hardest thing with getting an arts project off the ground um, for with crowdfunding is that you aren't selling something that people can use right you don't you don't have a video of your like scooter that folds into a backpack and somebody like walking down the street with it right like you can't make anybody go oh i need that you have to make people say oh i really want to see that and you have to do it without giving away your story right because you have they at the end of the day at the end of all of it they still need to be able to watch something um and so we had just had this really um i guess great uh it was just this great spot of timing where we were able to time our um our campaign around a festival run of our pilot episode so getting out there to these different festivals showing the the pilot episode to 50 to 200 people at a time anywhere from kansas city to texas to uh, colorado to new york to la um, we just got it in front of a lot of people and we encourage people that if they want to back the rest of the season um, then to let other other folks know as well and the word of mouth really spread that way, I think. And it was really, really useful for people to actually see what they were buying into, right? <laughs> what they were what they were gonna be backing. It wasn't just a one and one and a half minute trailer and then, you know, four minutes of me and Steven talking. Um, it was, you know, this is the show. This if you like this show and you wanna see more of it, then um, then go get behind it. And I think that was a huge, huge um, benefit to us. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the release and 
getting picked up by Hulu and, you know, being able to engage with an audience in a different way. Now it's on an SVOD platform. So I can you just talk a little bit about the reception and how people have been able to reach out to you and express how they've enjoyed the show? It's funny how um, instantaneous that feedback is now. <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, after spending a few years uh, working on the show and then getting it out there, you know, to have people after 24 hours ask for season two um, was very, <laughs> very exciting. But also you're kind of like, oh, man, maybe maybe check out season one again. You know, there's a lot of time we spent on that bad boy. <laughs> um, so I, and I, it's funny because I've heard people kind of talk about that before or mention that that kind of um, – that dynamic um, and it would kind of laugh and like, Oh, but that's great news. People are wanting a season two, but to actually feel it this time around um, after, you know, the work that we put on the show and then to have that, that feedback, um, it was like, Oh man, like we, we don't even know if like season two can happen. Um, so um, overall though, um, you know, you never know how it's going to be received, especially with us, um, you know, knowing that a lot of people that had seen us, you know, on one tree hill, um, we're gonna we're gonna see a show that was not One Tree Hill. It was very it's very racy. Um, there's you know swearing. There's drugs. These guys when you're meeting them, they're they're in a bad place in their lives. Um, you're starting them, you know, near rock bottom. So um, we were just we were a little concerned about that, or just aware of it, you know, and and uh, afraid that you know if you know, these these people have wide ranging tastes, but you're still like I hope that they you know they're not um, you know so comfortable with, I guess, um, you know, the characters that we've played on, on these other shows um, that uh, they don't want to see them because they, they have such a firm bond with, with those characters in these other shows to see the actors that played these characters that they love. Um, in this space, we just, I don't know, I hadn't experienced it before and was unsure of the response. Um, but thankfully, you know, um, we, and we found this out early on, actually, when, when people would come up to us after seeing um, the show at, at some of these festivals that they enjoyed seeing us in, in a different light and something, you know, um, a little more grown up as far as, as, you know, they've grown up too. the audiences have grown up and, and um, they're older now. And, and so um, to feel like they're growing up with us and, and ready for kind of, um, you know, humor, dark humor, that's a little uh, close to home and, and relatable um, as opposed to the, you know, extraordinary circumstances around One Tree Hill and the characters there. Uh, it, it was cool to have them respond positively. And then also, um, you know, people that were a part of the project um, that lend us their time and, and um, you know, friends and family to, to just, you know, get an overall, for the, for the most part, a, a positive reaction to people get the show, understand what we were trying to do, um, engaging with, with questions and, and those little moments that people are on Twitter talking about a specific you know, funny moment to them that we're, you know, maybe we don't get a lot of love for, but like finally somebody shouts out the one moment that we think is really funny. We're like, we're rooting that on, you know, you're like, oh, that banana is fucking funny, isn't it? Um, so it, it, it's, it's just cool to, uh, to get that instant feedback and, and find those little moments that we really hope that people could, could see some comedy in, even if it's a really dark moment um, for them to connect with that uh, is like, it's, it's awesome. Um. So, like, speaking of a second season, like, like I, I don't know if that's something that's happening or whatever, but I guess the, the, the question I have is, now that you're on Hulu, like, do you feel like the door to pitch them on supporting what would be a second season is open? Or if you were to do a second season, would it be the same kind of deal where you'd have to go back to crowdfunding and do it all over again from where you, like, just like you did the first time? That's a good question. That's the question that's on our minds right now. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, we are licensed content for Hulu. We are not a Hulu original. Um, so, uh, you know, I do feel like in a way the show is sort of auditioning on their platform. Um, and I don't know what exactly it's auditioning for. I don't know if it's auditioning for them to come in and partner with us at some point, or if it's just um, sort of auditioning for a sort of spot there in their library for a long time so that we have time to go make a season two some other way independently. Um, we're not really sure what the answer to that is right now. I think you know, something that's really exciting for us it, that's on the horizon is that we are going to be distributed internationally. Um, those deals are being made and, um, you know, we're hoping that in the spring here that the show is going to be out in um, a bunch of different territories all over the world. Mm -hmm. 
And I think after that point, we'll really get a feel for the demand for the show. Um, you know, how much the show is worth financially, how much the show is worth creatively um, to an audience. And you will have a better sense of what uh, season two will look like for us. You know, I mean, we're gung ho about doing it. We, we really feel like, you know, we have so many options on the table because now we have a television show that we still own completely. Um, and that's just an amazing position to be in. And I feel like it's, it's extremely rare. So we'd be silly not to capitalize on that in some way and, and keep this thing going um, and, and in, in a creative way. Right. So I, you know, obviously a partnership with who with Hulu would be um, a total dream for us, but at the same time, we are like, totally poised to go out there and um and get it done creatively i don't think we'd crowdfund again um i, I don't know that we'd survive that uh, <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that anybody would forgive that um <laughs> but i think at this point we've learned enough along the way to know that there are um there are other ways to get it done is it written have you written season two or is that the part of the the plan is it um you're waiting to see if your approach and if that could be financed first before you write it or do you already know exactly where you're going with the story yeah for, for the most part we do uh we we've you know we kind of ironed some things out when we when we were first writing the show um and we were first pitching it you know people want to know where season two or season three would go so mm -hmm. we've got some broad strokes there we don't have our full scripts for those episodes yet um, and we also, um, you know, James and I have been talking about this, you know, we, um, are looking forward to going in and, and there's already some ideas after just the way season one played out for us and the actors that came in and just, I mean, um, you know, we gave them a, a lot of freedom to, um, you know, we wanted them to come in and, and take, uh, you know, bold, make bold choices and take leaps with the character, um, that they you know, felt inspired to do. And they did that in strides. And, and I think it, it, really helped the show as far as um you know seeing these characters that we just had a little something in mind of, of what they thought if they're just coming in for one scene one episode um and then have these actors come in and just knock this stuff out of the park and just you know, blow our minds with, with who this character is it's made us kind of look at the drawing board and be like all right we gotta like we want this person to come back we want this to, this character to have more of a major role um and so you know we want to go in and and play to that um and so we still have a lot of work to do to get the scripts ready for you know uh, season two. But uh, for the most part, you know, our ideas are laid out. Um, so I want to take it back to One Tree Hill really quick and just ask a question about like being on that show and like were there things that you learned from being on a show like that for so long that you took in to making your own show? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think. The experience directing on One Tree Hill when, you know, um, I got to direct four episodes of the show. Um, I mean, that's just that's just completely invaluable experience for so many reasons. Um, you know, just being behind the camera, um, being sort of, you know, directing the scenes, but also directing the set, um, really getting into that mindset of like, OK, I'm not here as an actor anymore. I am here as a part of this like living, breathing organism that is a film set, that is a television set, um, that it was, you know, a totally perspective shifting experience for me and one that I just got addicted to immediately um, because it's the most alive I've ever felt on set. I've been on set since I was a child as an actor and, you know, you're, it's a wonderful place to be and, but you're always focused on what you're doing. You're always focused on your objective. Um, it's a very private process between you and your other actor and the director, right? But when you're, directing you are you are alive you are part of it you are part of that organism and that is um just something that i really took to and so that's something that i really you know enjoy bringing in into this and i think the other thing is like just being on a tv show for that long the the cadence of um storytelling really starts to sink in by osmosis like you just can't you have to be completely ignoring um, the way that the story develops in order to not learn something along the way. I'm um, just reading, you know, 187 television scripts over the course of that, that much time, you sort of, you get a feel for it and you get a feel for how important it is for these characters. You know, when you have an ongoing, when you're telling a serialized ongoing story, you, you, you get a feel for how important it is for these characters to be um, entangled with each other in several different ways. You know, you get a feel for that sort of like, that sort of like character map where everybody is sort of connected in all these different ways um, and in ways that feel authentic and in ways that are giving you 
um, conflict or um, compassion or comedy or whatever you're going for, right? Like um, those are things that I don't think that I could have learned had I not been on a TV show for that long or, you know, um, I think the only other way to learn that is to be in a writer's room, right? Is there going back at this point? I mean, is like the box open, is Pandora's box open and it's never, it's always going to be a multi-hybrid profession for everyone on this team from now on? <laughs> no, I mean, we, we um, I, I, yeah, there's some responsibilities that we'd like to, uh, you know, to, to spread out and, and not wear all the hats at all, uh, at all times. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it, a lot of it's, it's appealing to us. I mean, James and I, I've never edited anything before, um, and, and we edited this, uh, and, and through a lot of trial and error, you know, we found out that we, you know, have a good system that we enjoy, um, and we're able to work together, and um, we like, you know, uh, having that control of, okay, what we're thinking when, you know, you're writing something, and then um, obviously what it was like on, on set when we shot it, and then, you know, what we felt like maybe trying, you know, the moments that really worked when we were on set and, um, you know, the actors are playing at the scene and what's, what's kind of striking, you know, um, you, your, your interest the most and, and wanting to go into the edit and be able to actually pinpoint that there as well and create that feeling again. I think that, you know, through that process, we found that, uh, you know, we've got a good system that works in, in, in creating stuff. Um, but I mean, I think, um, you know, there was, uh, we were out of our league and some of our producing duties, the short running could be very tough. <laughs> and, um, thankfully, you know, our producing team, uh, Michelle Lang, who works with, uh, Ian and Esham Nelms, those, uh, writer directors, um, um, she was very, very crucial into keeping us on the path and, and, you know, keeping us organized as to like, here is what, you know, you need to attend to next, um, and prioritizing for, for us and, and trying to, you know, see what she can handle on her own. Um, and, and so I think, you know, having those people that are um, so dedicated to the project um, that understand where your weaknesses are and can come in and fill them um, was huge for us. And, and so um, Michelle was one of them. I mean, Ian and Eshin Nelms also were, were there stepping up uh, for us. Johnny Durango uh, is another executive producer on project who's worked with Ian and Esham. It's, it's a little filmmaker family we've got going here. And I was happy enough to jump in with um, that James has done these movies with before. But Johnny Drago, who was our DP, who's DP'd the Nums movies as well. Um, look, everyone um, understood what we were, what they're getting into with this project, how we had little money, very little money, and um, people needed to step up and, and just, you know, if they saw something amiss, figure it out, you know, uh, for everyone else for, for the sake of the project. And people did that. Um, so I think we would like to give everybody a little help. Johnny Durango was also camera operating. I think he would like to give up the camera, you know. Um, Michelle was wearing the hats of five different producer, producing jobs, you know. And meanwhile, she was also on camera sometimes as well. So I think, you know, we'd like to divvy it up a little bit. Um, but, you know, we, we do feel like um, the, the, the challenge of all that is, is still appealing, you know. Um, I, I know, you know, James is, is you know, has been an actor for so long, but he's a very talented director and writer as well. And we will continue to do that stuff. Um, and then the producing duties that come along with it. And for myself, you know, I always wanted to direct, I uh, was able to direct an episode in this and, um, you know, look forward to being able to do that again. Um, so at the end of the day, it's all about telling stories. And so, you know, whatever we got to do, whatever hat we got to wear to tell them <laughs> and, and be involved in the miracle that is getting something made, then we will do it. So, so Stephen, just as you said, this was like your first time directing on the show. Can you talk about like the biggest challenge that you face stepping into that role, especially like for the doing it for the very first time? Well, I directed a commercial my senior year of high school. Does that count? Okay. It does <laughs> sure. count. Yes, it sure. counts. Sure, of course. We had to do in our English class. Everyone had to do a make a commercial, and I was very oh, and outdoor science school, middle school, uh, outdoor science school in yeah middle school. I had we we had uh, some sort of a little play sketch, and I really wanted to direct it. And the part of that was was like three different variations of a director: one that was like very energized, and one that like didn't care. And so I played all of that. So there's some directing in my past, if we want to call it that. <laughs> These are on his resume, by the way. These are definitely on his resume. <laughs> uh, kidding aside. Um, actually yeah i mean to take on you know a uh, fully formed project this is this was you know new for me um and 
I, James had actually, so with the episodes, uh, we started by writing, um, we had everything outlined, right? And then we would go in and uh, we divvied up the episodes. It's like I got the odds and James got the evens to start. And then we would, we would swap them. Um, and James had written this episode, episode six, that, um, you know, right off the bat, I mean, the first read, I was, I, I, I love the story. They're going, you know, on this road trip. Uh, they're meet, you're meeting my character's parents. Um, and they're, you know, headed out in the redwoods for a little, you know, um, inspiration and, and, and life uh, awareness uh, <laughs> retreat <laughs> between the two of them. Um, and it just spoke to me. And I, 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 I thought that, um, you know, I, I wanted to, because originally we, we had spoke, we, we talked about James just directing all the episodes. Um, and, you know, I, I told him, I was like, hey, look, I understand um, if we want to keep it uh, as is. But um, if, if you're open to the idea, you know, I feel like this is one that, you know, I, I, I'm really gravitating towards and I'd like to take it on. Um, and and I, the way it was mapped out, too, like we were going to have to go to the Redwoods. So a lot of the, a lot of the, um, the f- days of shooting, obviously, we're not going to be in our, our main schedule. Um, and so it was like, OK, I can kind of tackle this on the side where James is handling, of course, the, 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 the re- all the other episodes in that you know, first 30 days of the shoot. Um, and yeah, thankfully James was open to the idea. And, um, you know, from there, yeah, uh, it was, um, you know, I, I, be as prepared as, as you, as you wish, you know, as, as, or as much as you can. Um, but still, you know, on the day, um, there's nothing like, you know, when, you know, you're running out of daylight and, um, you know, you've got to get something done and you're starting to drop shots and, you know, the whole, team is looking at you like all right what do we do next <laughs> where are we going you know and um you know to to learn that and then also there's just a, also a lot of being able to think more ahead of uh, the editing part of it all which i, I think now i'm uh, having editing having edited the the episodes um is, is very helpful in understanding uh, what you can prioritize in your shots because uh, i think that there's some shots that i wouldn't you know i prioritize that i shouldn't have and there's some that could have dropped off that actually really needed and would have been screwed without if it wasn't for guys like, you know, Johnny Durango uh, and, and James to be there to be like, Hey, I'm pretty sure you're going to need that shot. And it's like, and then we're sitting in the edit and I'm just like, Oh my God, look, what if I just skipped over that? So, um, you know, the main thing is, is, you know, obviously trying to come in as prepared as possible, but uh, thankfully having good people around me uh, to, um, you know, help lift me up obviously when, when I was going through my growing pains was, was, was crucial. But, um, it was exhilarating and fun and the most fulfilling thing uh, I've done in the entertainment industry. That's, that's for sure. We interviewed uh, the Nelms brothers two weeks ago now, Ulrich, and it was one I think of longer, our, but oh, yeah, it feels like time? just two weeks ago. <laughs> I know. Uh, but it was one of our most popular shows. Like people just responded very well to it. And we heard a little bit of the story of how James and the Nelms brothers met, but can you talk a little bit how they got involved uh, in this project and, and the, their roles. So, um, you know, once Steven and I had really nailed down the idea and fleshed out the story um, for the pilot episode and just knew exactly what kind of show we wanted to make, um, my first call was to Ian and Nash to be like, hey, can you guys like meet up? We need to, we need to talk because <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. And um, yeah, it was just our first instinct to, to, to bring them in and, um, you know, ask them and um you know michelle and johnny that filmmaker family that i'd worked with before um to to be a part of this to help us make it a reality because we knew that they could make it a reality on the scale that we wanted to make it a reality i'm sure that there was some version of this show that we could have just sort of um shot with the resources and the uh, expertise that we had on hand at the time but it would not have looked like this like we knew that we if we were going to do this we wanted it to look and feel like a show that we would watch um, that we would see on a major streamer. Um, and we knew that we could execute that because the, um, we knew that we could execute that if we had the Nelms Brothers camp behind us because they were making high quality stuff. They were making, you know, they were making blockbuster feature films for no money. You know what I mean? Like, um, the, you know, just like blockbuster looking films and feeling films. Like they really knew what they were doing. And um, so to me and to Steven, it was crucial to have them on board and, and guiding us. And thankfully, um, you know, we sat down and sort of pitched them the idea and they had their questions and we had our answers and, and, and thankfully they came, they came right on board. They saw what we were going for. And, um, and, you know, I, I can't say enough about their whole team's involvement, you know, between 
like Steven said, Johnny being our cinematographer, but also being our A camera operator and also being our executive producer and also finding us financing contacts um, to Michelle Lang wearing 80 different hats to Ian and Esh, you know, being on set every single day, being our eyes when we're, you know, on camera, like one of them or both of them is back there at Video Village, um, sort of, you know, you consulting, you know, telling us what we miss, telling us, giving us ideas for what else we can hit in that scene, um, being there for us. I mean, we had no, when we, when we sat down to edit, we had no equipment. We didn't have an editing machine. We had our laptops, like our five-year-old laptops, right? Like, so Esh brought over his like huge, um, I, I don't even, what was that? It was like an iMac, you know, it was like a tank. The thing weighed like, like 200 pounds. It was from, you know, I think it was what 2003. they edited. Yeah, it was what they edited Lost on Purpose on in like 2011 or something. But it's what they had and it worked and it was, you know, it was, um, it was their tried and true machine. And so they lent that to us and we edited the pilot on that. Um, and then, you know, the whole team has been there for us um, throughout the entire process. And, you know, like Steven said, we, we couldn't do it without him. But yeah, I mean, I think their, their involvement was uh, totally, totally invaluable. And, um, you know, I'm just so thankful for all the years that we've worked together um, before that, because, you know, that's where, you know, they, they've really taught me personally the importance of, of, of making those connections and forming those bonds in the industry and, um, you know, finding your camps of people that you really do enjoy working with and um, being sure to be there for them when they're trying to make things because they're always going to be there for you. You know, that's that's how um, they really showed me the power of that and that that is how um, things get made in this industry, but also good things. You know, I feel like you can feel um, when there is a team of people behind a project that actually cares about it. There's something sort of nebulous about that that sort of comes through in the finished product. I think it comes through in the Nelms Brothers product. I think it came through and everyone is doing great. And I, I, you know, I see the importance of that. Yeah, I was just going to, just to add to that, I think that, um, you know, what, what I've learned in this process and what, what I've seen kind of having jumped into this filmmaker family just on this project, seeing the relationship that everyone had uh, on set and, 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 you know, the experience that they've had together um, to really be able to, to step in and, and pick up the slack where it need be, or even if it's not even, you know, your job, but just the awareness. Uh, I, I think, you know, for years, you know, James is, um, you know, he was working at One Tree Hill, uh, has, a lot, has had a lot of opportunities, I think, come his way. And then working with, you know, the Nelms brothers early on where, you know, this is a story he, you know, he saw that their look, they had crowdfunded a uh, movie, uh, the money for a film, budget for film. And, you know, just really believed in the story and wanted to work for them. And, you know, James, who's already a very low ego guy and, and a pillar of professionalism, went and, and worked with these guys and um, continued to, to work with them. And, and not with ever expecting anything down the line, but just because he believed in their stories and believed in them. You know, he didn't, making money on them was not the, you know, was not the goal with these projects. It was just, he set out to, I think, you know, t tell these stories with these guys. And, um, I think it's a natural evolution of that where all of a sudden James is of age and it's not like he's like, when am I going to get a chance to like go to the Nums brothers and, and, you know, ask them for kind of a favor, you know, it's more of like, huh, like I'm even inspired by these people. And then it, when I'm ready to tell the right stories, cause we've both been, you know, telling different stories that haven't seen the light of day for some time and then realizing how instrumental it is to get the help you need to fill in those weaknesses. Um, you know, it was, you know, it was natural for James to be able to go to them and say, hey, you know, we'd like to have you guys a part of this. If not, no worries. But, you know, I just really feel like, you know, seeing the way you guys have worked over these years um, and, and seeing what we want to make, we can blend that together and create something if they're trying to get into TV, which thankfully they were. And the lesson of that is, you know, um, you know, always kind of finding your way um, to, to just – I think help work on different projects to involve yourself with people that you believe in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, James wasn't involving himself with the Nelms brothers early on because he knew that he'd have a show with them at Hulu in like 10 years. He had no idea where the relationship was going. He's just like, I connect them with these people. And even though they're different from me, like in whatever ways, like we see, you know, I've, I've, uh, we see the kind of storytelling in a similar way. Um, our, our um, you know, appreciation gels and, and, and interest kind of gel. And, and I think that, um, when you find people like that, it's it's so important to grab onto them and just work with them in whatever way you can. Um, and, and I've done that just on, you know, whether it's short films or 
other little pilots that independently I've been involved with and trying to, you know, to create. Um, but it's just that spirit of, you know, being there for a story and being there for people that you believe in and doing that over, you know, years. That's what eventually naturally gets you, you know, I think, to a position where um, the right stars are aligning and, and you know, um, th- there's an opportunity to hopefully have something that go a little bit further than the project did before, you know. Um, it takes time, but it takes a lot of, um, you know, checking the ego at the door and being able to um, just help come in and show up, step up, you know, step up and step in for people that, that need your help um, wherever you can on sets and in telling stories. So eventually, you know, one day when, when you're ready, you know, the opportunity will be there. So I wanted to get, press you guys on a question that Liz asked earlier. Um, like, you know, you, you, you've you obviously been actors is the main thing that you guys have done for your careers. But now you're creators, you have your own show, writers, directors, filmmakers. Can you guys go back to just going to audition after audition and trying to get the next acting role? Or is it like, no, I'm a filmmaker for life going forward? Yeah, I think we can still audition. You know, there's um, <laughs> we've been doing it for so long. It's uh, it's it's a part of us, if you will. Uh, we wouldn't have as many of the hilarious stories um, that we did for the show if it wasn't for auditioning all those years <laughs> of auditioning. Um, it's very true. Look, there's something. It's it's obviously not an enjoyable experience. Um, rejection sucks, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's good for character. It's it builds your character. Um, you going through the process, getting different roles to break down, um, getting different scripts to break down, having the opportunity to step into a different role, even if it's just for the brief moment that it takes for, for you to make the tape. Um, that's the exercise, right? That's the practice. That's what makes you a better actor. And at the end of the day, I think we both, we still love acting. Um, we still consider ourselves actors. And, um, you know, auditions are just another opportunity to act. And uh, it doesn't matter how, how brief it is. And so, um, yeah, it is a bit of a grind. Like, you know, I could go with never having to do a pilot season again, that's for sure. But, I, you know, I think I'll always be available to audition. Because I also think that the up, the experience of being on set as an actor has evolved for me and that now it feels like, it really does feel like a vacation. Um, coming out of, um, you know, finishing, <laughs> we were still kind of finish, finishing, everyone is doing great. We were like, you know, working on, we were, we were doing like the sound sound editing or something. And um, I, I booked a role on the right stuff, the Disney Plus series. And so I went out to Florida to shoot that for about five or six months. And I'm, I'm telling you, like being on set, I felt like I was I felt like I should be doing something all the time. Like in between takes, sitting in a cast chair, talking to other people, I was crawling out of my skin. I didn't know what to do with myself, <laughs> you know, like sitting in my trailer while everybody's working on set. I'm just like, OK, this is not this is not right. <laughs> it does not feel right. But then eventually. Eventually, I sort of eased into it and I was able to see it for what it was, which was just like, OK, this is the easiest job in the world. This is such a cakewalk. I mean, it, it helped that my particular character wasn't at the forefront of the show. You know, I had a lot of downtime, but I was able to just enjoy it. And, and just it was a great reminder of what a gift being on set as an actor actually is. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully this improving my uh, audition capabilities just based on the fact that it's like oh we've got other things that we can do well as, <laughs> as well yeah. instead of just like always having all my eggs in the acting basket putting all the pressure in every audition and every you know new opportunity it was like this has to be the one and just going in there you know stiff as a board trying to be perfect you know um i think that i i felt like there's a little bit of relief of that pressure um and also getting another perspective you know we didn't do a ton of casting on this we, we did a lot of word of mouth of of people especially through the nelms um and michelle and, and johnny and, and finding actors for the show because you know we needed people that we that weren't gonna you know expect a trailer and you know be in a chair in a corner on top of other people you know and we need people that were down for the cause and so um when we did when we did actually go casting uh it was you know, a whole nother perspective um, and very interesting to be on the other side of the table. And, and, and just, I, I think having that experience now um, kind of gives me a whole different, um, you know, perspective going into, to reading an audition. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm looking for them to, for my auditions to approve <laughs> now that I'm looking for excited to actually getting back in the room with people now that uh, uh, I've gone through this experience. And also I miss it. You know, I think, it's nice to put something on tape. I think it's good to 
send in a tape, do, be able to do it from home. It's convenient. You're sending in, you know, what you want. But I think there's also, you know, kind of a masochist, I guess, in the way of just wanting to go in and only get my one shot for the people who knows who knows what kind of day that they're having. And we play with this on the show, um, what kind of mood that they're in and uh, being able to, to, to grab their attention for a couple of minutes. Um, it's been a while since I've done that now, uh, obviously, with the pandemic that we've been in. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to doing that. Um, and yeah, it's auditioning is terrible, terrible beast, but it's a part of the game. And we, we kind of love it in a sick way. <laughs> I believe it's time for our final questions. Uh, so these are I'm going to try to reformat them. Usually we ask um we, we, guys, we talked to a lot of directors, so I, I'm like realizing the like very um, narrow lens in which we've we've run the show sometimes. So I'm going to try to figure out. But the question is, what's the first film you ever made and how do you feel about it now? But you could talk about it in terms of performing in a film, writing a film, whatever you want to do. But what's the first uh, project storytelling project you ever made and how do you feel about it now? Um, I think the first storytelling project that I was ever a part of um you know, I, I I don't consider I don't consider One Tree Hill. I, even though I directed on One Tree Hill, that was my first experience behind a camera. That wasn't really my creative sort of vision. But um, I did I did make a documentary, uh, produce a documentary with um, uh, directed by Zach Herman, who was a friend of ours, and he was actually our um, our sort of Wilmington, North Carolina producer. And everyone was doing great when we went out there with the Splinter Unit. Um, but back in I want to say 2005 or six, maybe. Um, we made a documentary together called For Keeps that was about a, um, a minor league basketball team that was uh, a startup minor league basketball team that was in Wilmington called the Wilmington Sea Dogs. Um, and it was, you know, it belonged to this really bizarre league. And um, it was this sort of like underworld of, I don't know, it wasn't, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to say anything bad about it, actually. It was just, it was really <laughs> interesting. It was a really interesting setup, this whole thing. Um, but there were some incredible characters that were actually running this individual team. Um, and they were all really, really wonderful people. And they had great stories from all over the place. And we just thought we, we have to, you know, we have to shoot this. We have to shoot this inaugural season and, um, and just see how this goes and see what we can get out of it. And so we literally pulled together, um, you know, uh, just pulled some money together, pulled together some equipment, some cameras, and just like showed up every day at their practices and interviewed the players and you know, traveled with them in road games. Um, went to, uh, you know, you know, interviewed the uh, coaches and the front office and um, all these different people and really got to know them. And and um, the documentary that came out of it, I think I'm really, really proud of it. Um, it, it premiered at the Kukuloris Film Festival. Um, you know, I think we shot the whole thing with one camera. I think very rarely do we have two cameras. Um, but the, um, you know, director, Zach Herman, he had this incredible he knew he was a great editor as well. And he was a great, he had a great eye for ear for music and he had a great eye for his shots. And he made a really like artful and sensitive and intimate sports documentary, which is, I think, you know, was really ahead of its time because, you know, this is way before 30 for 30. Uh, this is way before the explosion of, you know, sports documentaries that we've seen recently. And um, so I'm, I'm really proud of that because that felt unique at the time. And, um, and yeah, I just really love that experience. Should I go back to my middle school outdoor science yeah. school play or <laughs> the commercial senior year? Now, these were not paid gigs. I did not get hired for these gigs. I just took the position. Um, but it's it's funny. My mind just goes there because it, it's especially with um, directing the commercial in, in, in high school. It was one of those like light bulb moments where, um, you know, someone needed to take control. And uh, I just kind of stepped in and I enjoyed that. And I, I felt like I had a vision and I think taking that having an idea in your mind uh, and kind of sharing that with other people and then having it playing out and then having these images cut together I was like this is the coolest thing ever and I'll never forget that feeling and so to continue to have that still kind of the childish uh, or youthful should say um, feeling of uh, a little idea that is in your brain that eventually finds its way to a page and then maybe into, you know, an actor's mouth and then into an edit and then into a feature. It's, uh, um, you know, or an episode of TV, whatever is, uh, is so exciting, especially when, where it, you know, how, how it evolves along that path, you know, and how the people that different people that come in, add layers to it, uh, show you a side to it that you did not see before. Um, yeah, it's just a drug. I love it. 
what's the best filmmaking or acting advice that you've ever received? Uh, I think the best filmmaking advice that, that I received, um, well, that uh, Stephen and I both received this advice from the Nellens brothers. And it was watch every single second of every single reel, um, that you have in, in your footage, um, because there's something hiding in there, it, whether it's, you know, in the pre-roll or whether it's in the, in the post-roll, whether it's just like, you know, uh, when the camera guy has the camera on his shoulder and we're rolling, but he doesn't know where to point the camera yet or something, or when an actor doesn't actually know that when an actor is not in the scene yet, maybe they're just making some funny face or something like you can get reaction shots from those, or you never know, you just never know what that frame is going to show you and how you can use it creatively in your edit to, um, you know, completely change a scene or, you know, get yourself a reaction shot that you don't have, or, um, you know, it's just, like that was really, really useful for us because we did watch every single second of every single reel that we shot. And um, we ended up using, you know, we ended up tagging and marking different little things that we saw actors doing and we were able to sort of label them. And then we were able to use these pieces um, to create um, either a moment that made sense or a moment that felt totally bizarre and wasn't ever in the scene ever in the first place, whether it was a script or, you know, it wasn't actually acted in the scene, but we were able to craft it from a creative edit because we watched to, you know, the very end of this reel where this brilliant thing happened, right? And um, and that was, yeah, that was huge. We got a lot of golden moments out of that. And it also, I think, just helped calibrate us for the experience of making sure that we were going to be paying attention all the time when we were editing, when we were watching this footage back, making sure that we were always looking for something and never really zoning out, right? Like, we never really accepted our first cut of every single scene because we knew that there are creative ways to get something better out of it um so so yeah that was amazing advice watch every second of the footage you have because it's so valuable mm -hmm. yeah i would just on top of that say um just getting to know everybody that you're working with making sure you know everyone's names it sounds simple but someone told me this early on when i was young in the industry and uh it stayed with me and um i feel like yeah uh just a little, little effort goes a long ways this can also be said as don't be a dick, you know, we're all <laughs> in this together. Um, and, and so I, I think that just a little kindness goes a long ways, you know, recognize within yourself whenever you're not having your good days and, and try to, you know, work through it um, because it only takes one time of telling somebody off and that person will never, you know, want to work for you or, or um, you know, have good things to say about you for the rest of their life. Uh, do you have a very, do you have a specific career goal? Whew. Season two of Everyone is Doing Great. <laughs> Season two of Everyone is Doing Great, yeah. Um, I think to direct a feature film would be amazing. I think that's, um, you know, the priority right now is Everyone is Doing Great. Season two, 100%. But I think that long game is to direct a, a feature film eventually. Um, you know, just, uh, I think the, I don't know what the word is. It's, it's you know, just seeing what the Nelms Brothers have done for so long with their feature films, um, seeing how they can pour themselves into something for, you know, the period of time that it takes to write it, obviously, but then the period of time that it takes to shoot it and edit it, and then you get to release it out into the world and it's its own thing and it has its own life and you can move on to the next thing. Um, that is a concept that I um, am really attracted to because I haven't had a lot of that in my life, having mostly worked in television. Um, so, you know, I, I would love to build, a t uh, you know, a film from the ground up and be able to just sort of let it fly and say, that was, that was a film I made and I expect to make no more of it, you know? <laughs> Awesome. Well, it's Wait. 12. Oh, yeah, but Stephen didn't answer the question. But yes, it's 12. Oh, I thought, I thought he did. I thought That's he said... He's got time for him to answer. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm going to... Uh, I agree with James. Uh, make a feature film. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought your answer was season two of Everyone Was Great. So That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it was. Um, well, we had one more question, but it's 12, so I think we got to skip to our final question, which is... Um, is making movies hard? Absolutely. Making, making, uh, making movies and making television is, <laughs> is extremely hard, yes. <laughs> Not for I the faint at heart at all. Not no, I've never heard anybody, all. it's crazy, I've never heard anybody say, oh yeah, that was an easy one. Yeah, that one, <laughs> that one, didn't, that one just was so smooth. Like, I, I just feel like that was a cakewalk. <laughs> like, I've never heard anybody, on any level, you know, whether you're making a movie for $50,000 or $50 million, I've never heard anybody say, yeah, that was easy. 
Um, thank you for coming on. If you want to take a second and sell your wares, tell people how to check out the show, where they can find you, contact you, whatever you'd like. Yeah, well, thank you guys for having us. Uh, everyone is doing great. Season one is airing on Hulu now, so check it out. Yeah, and you can follow us on Instagram at, uh, at everyone is doing great and on Twitter at, at EDG TV show. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, guys. Really, we haven't tweeted in a long time. Oh, yeah. Don't, just, follow, just us. Stick, don't, just stick don't follow us on Twitter. <laughs> don't do that. It's, it's defunct. Just stick to Instagram. <laughs> Instagrams, yeah. We have a lot of great stuff on Instagram. Shout out to Na, one of our producers. She's got a lot of great back uh, behind the scenes and uh, meet the cast and crew and stuff like that. So awesome. check out yeah. the Instagram. Amazing. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Um, do you want? Do you want to? I think it's you. I think it's you now to debrief James and Stephen, right? Oh shit! Sorry, you're right. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's. What do you remember about that conversation, Alric? I'm actually trying to remember what I remember about that conversation. <laughs> I remember being very excited for this because we we don't really have. Uh, actors mainly on the show and these guys um are you know actors first and then like they came to filmmaking so i was kind of excited to hear about you know the the transition from acting to you know being a writer and director and, and i think they talked about that quite a bit um and just like you know taking that leap from you know doing one role to the other and especially james because you know he's a he's also a director um, kind of on his own right, not just with this show. Like he's, you know, started by directing episodes of One Tree Hill and then moved on to other shows and stuff. And so I think like now, like he, he was talking about being on um, the Right Stuff show for, for Disney Plus and like not being, and just being an actor on it and like feeling like, oh my God, like I have the easiest job on set. Like I don't have to do anything else like av after having directed other shows and doing his own show. So I thought that was a really interesting story. Um, but yeah, no, it was fun. It was a fun conversation. What, what now do you remember? Does that jog your memory about? Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I think I, I remember them. And I, 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 I think I pressed them a little bit about this in the interview, but that they felt like they were outsiders was so amusing to me. Because and I and I find it very amusing when I do, like, you know, we get people be like, we didn't have much money, a few million dollars, like these kind of like um, uh, self deprecating comments about people's statuses. But they're so much higher than I am that I'm like just so amused by the fact that they feel they're outsiders. But then I guess if you think about the Hollywood like star maker machinery, they are actually fairly low on the totem pole, which is absurd because they right. have massive followers and so many connections and so much experience. So if it's hard for them, of course it's hard for us. You know what I mean? Of course, making movies is, is hard. I just uh, was amused uh, and in enjoyed that kind of like relatability that they had. And I liked, um, I thought it's also interesting. I don't know if you notice, if you notice this, but like Steven always deferred to James. <laughs> like yeah. I don't know if it does this like they both acted in One Tree right. Hill but like Steven would never really like refer to himself as an actor on the show he'd always be like well James you know James acted you know was in that show well, it was interesting kind of like deference there I think it's because James was on the show much longer like he was from the very beginning and he was a co-star with uh, Chad Michael Murray you know I think they were like kind of like equal level on the show for the whole time and then Steven only joined I think season five or four or something so I think he just felt like you know James is the OG and you know Steven's like relatively the newcomer and then he wasn't even like a main cast I think until like season eight but although it did go for I think it went for like 12 seasons or something it went on forever but um anyways you know I think just when you're on a show for that long like the amount of um you know money you must be making if you're like a main cast for like 12 years 12 seasons I don't know it boggles my mind but um it's interesting but I love what you're saying about this like they them feeling like feeling like outsiders because I think like Maybe it is like that. Like, I don't know. We haven't really talked to like a lot of like really, really high up people, you know, but I think just because you've had like success in the past or you've done things, it doesn't mean that you're going to always be on that level because there's always someone new. There's always someone hotter, younger, better, like, you know, got the, the more exciting movie that's like coming out or whatever. And it's like you're always like fighting to like have your project have have you know note and be worthy or whatever you know so 
I don't know. Maybe it's just always going to be that way no matter how high of a level you climb. You know, even if you're Christopher Nolan, you're still going to be like, man, no one cares about Tenet. Like, you know, didn't get a theatrical release and not that many people are renting it now that it's available. God, like, well, I lost my... Now what am I going to do? Is Warner Brothers going to hire me again? You know, like, I don't know. I'd love to talk to Christopher Nolan and hear if he has things like that to say. We'll, um, we'll just get Sean to, to bring him on the show. You know, that'll yeah. be an easy ask. He's got the uh, no, you're right? totally right. It's all relative. <laughs> and like everyone we talk to acts and feels like they're struggling and they haven't made it. And there, I think there are hierarchies to the people that we've talked to. But the one thing that um, flattens that line is no one feels um, safe or secure or confident in their position. So that sucks out there for everyone. <laughs> it's all terrible. Um, and with that, I think it's time to get to our Get Shorty. So you make movies, huh? I produce feature motion pictures. I got an idea for a movie. So, oh man, this week we have a short film, a short film from filmmaker and listener Derek Viveros, and I hope I'm saying your name right, Derek. Um, could be wrong. Uh, the film's called Pimples and Nipples which is pretty wild short. It's only five minutes, but um, so unless you're driving an automobile, I suggest you hit pause and watch it right now. And since we all work from home, you don't even have to worry that it's definitely not suitable for work because it is not. Do not play this in a cubicle, um, you know, around a bunch of people. Not a good idea. Anyways, here's Derek to talk about the film. Hey Liz, hey Ulrich, uh, thank you so much for having Pimples and Nipples on the uh, Get Shorty segment. I'm here with my uh, producing partner and one of the actresses in the short, uh, Christina Keel. She'll be here reading the questions uh, that you guys provided. So without further ado, let's go, because we have five minutes. All right, let's go. Why the hell did you make a short? Uh, it was just a natural progression uh, for from what I was doing early on in my career, just a bunch of sketches on Instagram and with my iPhone, so yeah. Just, the next step, the short film. Great, and then, and why this story? Why Pimples and Nipples? Uh, well, uh, me and Christina had won tickets to the uh, Hump Film Festival. And if you're not familiar, it's a, uh, an erotic, um, amateur, like local pornography type of film festival. And uh, I had gone and I was blown away by the uh, content and the, the, just the stuff that people were submitting. And I told Christina, I was like, I'm submitting uh, a short film to that uh, film fest. And how did your team, I, how did Derek come up with all the fun? <laughs> Derek just had some coins in the bank. So it was like roughly a thousand dollars. It wasn't anything crazy. I bought Crafty at Trader Joe's, <laughs> just so you know. Um, before making this short, what did you think would happen to your career because of Pipples and Pipples? I wasn't expecting anything. I wasn't, I mean, honestly, I, I had nothing to lose. Basically, so I was. It was more of a uh, an exercise for me, uh, an exercise for my, like my filmmaking, and um, just like an itch that I really wanted to scratch. So, yeah. And then, I mean, what did happen? I feel like. For... Well, what happened was intentionally it was supposed to be, you know, uh, for a hump fest, and then just like shelved after that. Like it was supposed to be like a dirty little secret. And then as I started showing more and more people, it was just it, it was kind of accepted. Like no one made a big fuss about it. So I actually started submitting it to festivals. And like out of 20, I got into four or five really cool fest underground LGBT uh, Q festivals. And it just, it was like, I was just shocked at how accepted it was considering, you know, some of the content that's in it. Yeah, well, and it was so, I mean, you made it hilarious and interesting and provocative. I mean, I think that is that's my, really like, uh, that was one of the reasons why I did it as well. I was trying to blend, like there's a fine line between, you know, graphic and funny. And like, I just was, I was, playing that line and I think we did it well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and now that it's out in the world, what purpose does your art uh, serve? <laughs> um, again, I just think it's like my little baby. It was like the first real project that I put some time and effort and uh, money into. So it's just one of those things that I'm just gonna look back when I'm 75 in my rocker <laughs> yeah. and my ear tubes and go, <laughs> and pimples like, and nipples. Grandpa, your wig was so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Would you do anything differently story-wise now that the story is done and released? Nope, uh, no. Things happen for a reason and there was some, a few little hiccups in the filming, 
Um, there was some extra shots we were supposed to put that didn't end up happening. But I think overall, everything that we put into the, the short was like yes. magic. It was meant to be. So original. I loved it. And why was it important to actually show a blowjob on camera in the short? Well, like I said, it was meant to be for a hump festival, but um, I think also it was meant for a reason because I wouldn't have I wouldn't have done this short, I wouldn't have done that scene if it wasn't for hump festival. And the fact that they didn't want me, they were like, this actually isn't enough. Or I don't know why they didn't want me. I should probably just call them up and ask them. But the fact that I did it and then they didn't want me and I ended up putting it out to the rest of the world and you guys wanted me is just like, yeah. What was the question? Well, <laughs> the blowjob. And how fun is it to watch something like funny and then uh and interesting in a sleepover and then all of a sudden you know it's good to rattle your audience right yeah. you like doing that yeah but anyway um thank you guys again for having us on the um the segment um anybody who's not following liz and Ulrich, uh you can find them on instagram and youtube making movies is hard and yeah that's that thank you guys <laughs> so liz holy shit i have to know what do you think of this movie Okay, my favorite thing is when I'm incredibly uncomfortable. Like it is this feeling that I cherish is, and I it's what I want to do to other people is to make them incredibly uncomfortable. In this film, Sean and I watched it last night, and my jaw dropped, and I like almost like hid in my clothing because I was so uncomfortable. Um, I really respect and I love love the filmmaker and love what they're doing even though i felt so weird the whole time right so um i just think derek has my uh has like i like want to give him a trophy um i and i want i don't have a lot to say other than like i just bravo for making something so fantastically uncomfortable but the other thing is that Yet again, we have a problem with clearances where you have an image of in sync and you have a pop song playing in the background and like, <laughs> come on, Derek, get it together. I want more people to see this short and I want you to not get in trouble or flagged for using copyrighted material. So like that's actually my main criticism is that the film didn't protect itself um, and cannot be monetized with that kind of stuff in it. So Derek, mm -hmm. fix it so we can promote it like hell. Yeah, I probably I mean, will have more to say after you you talk. <laughs> that I just I, I would I I have a lot to say about it, but I just want to cut to the um the big elephant in the short. Uh, there's a blowjob that is filmed like on screen in this movie. Yeah, so there's an erect penis. Yeah, that is sucked on screen. So the the question I have for yeah. you, Liz, is. Do you think that's necessary in this, or is is yeah. that like part of what makes it so shocking? Is that you see actually see that, or do you feel like, oh, the movie would still work on the same level if we didn't actually see someone give fellatio in this oh, film? Oh, Derek's goal is to make everyone uncomfortable, <laughs> and this is the ultimate way to do it because it is the ultimate taboo in media is to show an <laughs> erect penis. So for me, this is completely motivated nudity and makes perfect sense to be there. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I champion it. I champion how, how uncomfortable I am even talking about it. <laughs> like, well, because well, so like, you know, we, we, we had a movie on recently that had boobs in it, you know, and, you know, it was kind of discussed that, oh, this is completely unnecessary. Didn't really help drive the movie forward. So like I thought a wreck penis was like the perfect thing to bring on the show to like discuss like, okay, does this fit? And, you know, if, if you're talking about like in the in the vein of like a John Waters type movie or like this like e exploitation or even sexploitation type of thing, you know, maybe this is right. I don't know. You know, um, I will defend this 100 percent. And by the way, John Waters <laughs> is like one of the people that I would pray to if I had an altar like John Waters <laughs> is one of my absolute heroes. So I, I agree with you. It's this it, that's a great reference to bring up for this film. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I asked Derek, like in his answers, like like what was the inspiration for the blowjob, and so I'm, hopefully he just talked about what inspired him to actually do that, and he was the one who did it. You know, it was him as a filmmaker and the star who actually, you know, 
put the put the act on film in all the ways. So um, you know, kudos to him for having the balls to do that in the first place. Um, but uh, anyways, what what I well, the other things I had to say about it was uh, yeah, I loved how bizarre it was. Um, I thought it was really fun that Derek played multiple characters, especially doing like the dual orgasm at the end is like what the fuck holy shit <laughs> um and then i i just thought that it had a really strong sense of style and being really over the top and then it knew what kind of movie it was from one you know minute minute one or second one to to the end you know to the credits um and i felt like it was like kind of reminded me of kids in the halls but but even crazier than kids in the hall was you know it's like that but like with john waters like kids in the hall and john waters had a baby that was insane this is what it is gotta bring something up because that's gonna be derek's pull quote and i want to be derek's pull quote (laughs) and i checked um uh kyle kenyon's website the other day because i was just like oh i wonder if we were mentioned because we really just like gave him so much love and you were his pull quote (laughs) Albert. so now i have to like make something that's like really uh, quippable like derek is an is an under (laughs) derek is the next John Waters. Okay, use that, Derek. Use that. And then say Liz Manischel. Um, um, anyway, he's probably just going to quote you. Oh, that's hilarious. I didn't know that I was a pull quote for Kyle Kenyon. That's amazing. Thank you, you were, Kyle. even though I was the one obsessed with it. Totally cool. Thanks, Kyle. Um, uh. <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad you picked this, though. i really glad because I would never... When would someone have sent this to me? You know? Yeah. It's such a wild short. Yeah, I don't th- exactly like this is not something that I would find on my own or that would be sent to me by like, you know, the bots in the world that follow the stuff that I search. Like this is not something that would find my way. I mean, I don't know if you saw the um, the VHS poster cover for it that they had made that Derek sent along with the movie, but it's really cool. It was really neat. And especially with the whole like VHS part of it. And like that, that's like this whole like bizarre ring rip off just insanity. That's like, it's totally making fun of horror movies and everything at the same time. It's just, I don't know. There's so many things of this that's, that's just completely, there's just so much fun to be had in five minutes, but it's so crazy. And it does make you very uncomfortable. I mean, when the tampon pops out and lands on the tray, of jello sh- I was explaining this to Beth the, 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 the last night. I was like, "This," and she was like, "What the fuck? Like, <laughs> this movie sounds ridiculous." And it's like, it is totally I, ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have to say, there's um, I consulted with a, a filmmaker last year who is building an adult platform for art house erotic material, and mm. it was really really hard to do and she still hasn't quite figured it out because of the amount of um because you you like you can't use paypal as a currency whatever you could there's a lot of platforms that actually are controlled by entities that are censoring the content mm-hmm. essentially that they're associated mm-hmm. with and so um i just want to say like uh derek's a brave soul because this is going to be out there in the world and the fact that you know, Derek is, God, I know I'm trying to figure out the words because it's bravery. It's like, it's like cool factor. It's like punk rock, I guess. It's Maybe it's just like this rock. punk rock attitude of towards media and putting art out there that's meant to push boundaries. And I just think that's worthwhile. And I really, really want to support more things like that. So can we just put a call out to like weird shit? Like if you have weird <laughs> shit, Send it to us because I want to see more weird shit. Send us your weirdest short that you've ever seen or you made, and we'll we'll get it on the show. Um, all right, I think we have to go to You've Got Mail, but we don't have very much time. My breath catches in my chest until I hear three little words: You've Got Mail. Um, so Gary Kennedy left a wonderful, uh, comment on our YouTube channel as he, as he tends to do. Thank you, Gary Kennedy. And, uh, this is one of the more recent ones. So he said, it was really nice to hear you two talk so passionately about film at the end of this episode. Uh, editorial note, that was episode 300. Uh, there is definitely a fear at my age, not having made a feature yet may mean it 
uh, that it may, might never happen, but I'm still working toward it. So my question to you two is about writing. How do you outline your feature scripts? There are two feature scripts I'm working on, and although it's a complete story, it's just not anywhere near a feature length page count. Uh, Auric, how do you outline your feature scripts? I am a big believer in the beat sheet. I think beat sheets are great. I always come up with the ending first because I think the ending is really crucial. Um, like right now I have an idea in my head um, that I've got like a lot of the beats for, but um, and I've written out some of them, but I don't have the ending quite yet. So I think what I'll probably do is try to come up with the ending and then um, beat out to the ending and then start writing once I get there. That's like a super fast version of saying what I do. What about you, Liz? And we kind of tackled a question like this a few months ago when I was vomiting out a feature script in December. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing is I required, I did a page mandate and I, I did an outline, but the outline was like a uh, three act structure, you know, I think it's like eight sequences, you know, there's various different ways that you can plot out what you want to do. Um, and I think we would we should defer to Ulrich on, on how he does things or you can Google um, <laughs> outlines. But I thought page mandates were really helpful because mm. usually people don't finish their first draft. And it's like once you finish the first draft, you have something to work with. Right. So I would just encourage you to vomit out, do a, two pages a day, three pages a day if you can. And then um, I'm taking a rewrite course with Naomi McDougal Jones. And she has you not look at the script for a few weeks and then organize it essentially by theme. What, are, what, is the, uh, what is the organizing idea of the film and what's the shadow idea of the film? And I won't mm. give away all her secrets because you pay for the course, but um, that has been really helpful to me is Ooh. not reading the script and then building it up based off of what I remember and what I think has been salient in my mind. I like I like this idea of a main theme and a shadow theme. If, you know, that sounds really, really interesting. Um, and I would love to pay for Naomi's course. She was a great guest, by the way. Just shout out to Naomi McDougal Jones for being so great on the show when she was on a year ago. And we mention her almost every week now. So, yay. <laughs> uh, like learning from her. She's, um, she's a really cool person. Um, yeah. Yay. Shout out. Um, do you, should I say the thing of the thing? Should I, uh, I don't know. Do you have time to say the thing of the thing, or should we save it for next week? Okay, ooh, big cliffhanger. Yes. Um, so if you want to be like Gary Candy and write a YouTube comment, you can jump over to our YouTube page now at 207 subscribers. Woot, woot. Or you can support the show on Patreon like a lot of wonderful people have, including Derek. Who is um you know on the show this week with his insane insane movie pimples and nipples which everyone should see and uh, let us know how uncomfortable it made you because it made us both uncomfortable it sounds like um yeah you can do that at patreoncom slash podcast. give what you can thanks in advance um, if you want to send us a question comment or suggestion and skip all the other stuff like social media you can go to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com and just send us an email to that address. Um, and finally, you can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at MMIH Podcast and YouTube at Making Movies is Hard Podcast for the people who do love social media. Shout out to Madison and Travis just because we, <laughs> we forgot to the past few weeks. <laughs> and uh, we love you. Okay. Uh, thanks to them and, and everyone else for listening. Thanks to James Lafferty, Stephen Coletti, and Sarah Malarkey for making this show happen. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Liz Manischel or Instagram at Liz Manischel Film. And I've started, guys, I've started a TikTok channel. Whoa. I have two followers, so get ready. Uh, taking over the TikTok world. Ulrich, where can we find you? Uh, not on TikTok, I will tell you that much. Um, but at Instagram and Twitter at Ulrich B. Facebook, I am, you know, pretty much I don't post anymore, but I will accept all friendships still. So... <laughs> Maybe I'll start posting again at some point. Um, you can also check out our, yeah, this is where you can find me. Sorry. You, can, you could have kept going if you wanted to. Uh, <laughs> yes, Ulrich was about to say, and rightly so, check out our website, makingmoviesitshard.com, where you can find links to the things we talked about. Uh, thank you to Cameron, Cameron Caves, Cameron, best friend Cameron, for doing the editing. Thank you, Cameron, we adore you. Uh, thanks to everyone again for listening and talk to all y'all next week. Nice. 
I don't know. I really want that to work really well, where it's like one of us stops talking and then the other one does the in the the final word. Uh, I think oh. it's been been stumbly both times we've tried it. But, oh, because um, yeah, I I didn't really I know. I know it was presumed that I would say something there, but I still felt like you were teeing it up quite well. I know, I know. I was like on this roll and like the, the last time it happened the other way around where you would like kind of teed it up nicely for me and then I like dropped the ball because I didn't realize. Anyways, whatever. whatever. Whoever's editing this, cut it out. It's fine.